Good evening. Um, I'm Linda Partridge, the Biological Secretary of the Royal Society. And part of my duties is to have the great pleasure of introducing the Francis Crick Lecture for 2020. Normally this lecture would take place at Carlton House Terrace at the Royal Society headquarters. Um, but at the moment, because of the pandemic, the building is shut down. And so we're conducting the lecture and the questions afterwards remotely. So there will be an opportunity after the lecture has taken place um, for the audience to interact live uh, with me and with the speaker, um, to, and she will address any questions that come from the audience. So the Francis Crick Medlin Lectures awarded annually in any field in the biological sciences. Preference is given to genetics, molecular biology and neurobiology because these were the general areas in which Francis Crick worked. And also there's an emphasis on fundamental science and theoretical work, uh, which was the hallmark of Crick's own science. And the lectureship was endowed by Sidney Brenner in honor of Francis Crick, um, the co-discoverer of the structure of the DNA molecule. And the first lecture was given in 2003. The medal is of bronze um, and it's awarded each year and is accompanied by a gift of 2000 pounds. And Dr. Martis Latich is awarded the Francis Crick Medal and Lecture for 2020 for discovering how neural circuits generate behavior by developing and disseminating definitive techniques and by discovering fundamental principles governing circuit development and function. Marta Slatic is a remarkable person. She grew up in Zagreb in Croatia and after receiving a full scholarship from Trinity College, she moved to Cambridge where she read natural sciences, specializing in neuroscience and chemistry. Unbelievably, she is literate in eight languages and in parallel with her studies, she read a degree in linguistics at Zagreb University. And she was fascinated by the brain's ability to produce complex behaviors, such as human language and art. And she's therefore decided to pursue a career in neuroscience and to investigate how brains develop and generate behavior. She carried out her PhD work under the supervision of Michael Bate in the Department of Zoology at Cambridge and continued her postdoctoral studies as a Trinity College Junior Research Fellow. And in 2009, she was awarded a group leader position at the Janelia Research Campus, the Howard Hughes Campus, to study the circuit basis of behavior. And she ran a lab there for 10 years. In 2019, she was appointed a program leader at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, where of course Crick himself worked, and as a principal research associate in the Department of Zoology and a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. And I now invite uh, Marta Slatic to give the 2020 Francis Crick Lecture, and the title is How We Learn, Predict and Decide, The Circuit Basis of Behaviour. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you today. And I would first of all like to thank some people. I would really like to thank Simon Laughlin for nominating me and the Royal Society for honoring us with this incredible award. I'm also really grateful to Michael Bate for having been a truly inspirational PhD and postdoc mentor and to Jerry Rubin and Jim Truman for their mentorship and support throughout my time as a group leader at Janelia Research Campus. I'm also very grateful to Albert Cardona, my key collaborator and husband, and most of the work we are doing is in close collaboration with his lab. Finally, I would really like to thank a terrific team of past and present lab members who have done all the work I'm really grateful to them. I want to start today by showing you this video of three men stealing food from 15 hungry lions. The men have been attacked by the lions before and they know the danger associated with approaching them, but they've also learned 
that if they walk slowly and confidently, the lions will think they are being attacked and they will retreat and stay away just enough time for the men to steal a delicious piece of meat and then slowly and confidently walk away. While this is obviously an extreme example, learning which stimuli and actions are associated with rewards and punishments based on the learned information predicting the value of each action and then based on these predictions, selecting one action and fully suppressing all alternatives to enable a unified, coordinated and decisive response of the organism are fundamental brain functions essential for survival across the animal kingdom. In my lab, we are interested in understanding the circuit mechanisms that underlie these fundamental brain functions. To do that, we think we need to be able to combine three kinds of information. Nervous systems are networks of interconnected neurons. So it is essential to know the patterns of connections between neurons because they determine the possible flow of information and provide clues about the way in which nervous systems might perform particular computations. However, finding out the patterns of connections between neurons is really difficult because these connections are very small. So it is only possible to visualize them by imaging nervous systems with very high resolution electron microscopy, which is very slow. So until recently, we've only had a complete image data set of a nervous system and a reconstructed connectivity map for one species, that of a C. elegans, the nematode worm with 302 neurons. This work was done by Sidney Brenner and colleagues at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology. Now, fortunately, in recent years, the electron microscopy technology has greatly improved and it has now become possible to image with electron microscopy slightly larger nervous systems, those of small insects and even small vertebrates and map uh, connectivity from such electron microscopy data sets. But while such neuron connectivity maps are absolutely essential to understand how brains generate behavior, they are by no means sufficient. We also need to be able to visualize the flow of information through defined networks. We need to be able to determine which neurons actually become active when an animal performs an action, forms a memory, makes a decision, or perceives a stimulus. So we need to be able to obtain brain-wide neural activity maps. This has also recently become possible for transparent animals, thanks to advances in light sheet imaging microscopy, which enables us to image at relatively high temporal and spatial resolutions entire nervous systems of transparent animals. And in addition to that, thanks to the development of proteins that report the activity of neurons by changing fluorescence. So fluorescence activity reporters. And here is an example of a snapshot for, from such a neuron activity map from a zebrafish larva. So these little round circles are neurons that are active at this time point in the brain of the zebrafish. While such neuron activity maps are also absolutely essential to understand how brain generates behavior, even they are not sufficient. What we also need to be able to establish is causal relationships between activity in particular neuron types and behavior. So we need to be able to determine which activity actually causes a perception, causes a memory to form, causes a decision, causes an action. To do that, we need to be able to artificially manipulate activity in uniquely identified neurons. <laughs> 
We can do that in genetic model system with model systems in which we can target the expression of specific proteins to specific neurons. So there are proteins similar to rhodopsin found in our eyes that are uh, that, that are activated by light. So these are ion channels that are opened when a light shines. And when these channels open, this can activate or inactivate neurons depending on which ions they get. So by expressing these uh, different types of rhodopsin channels in specific neurons, we can artificially manipulate the activity of animals, uh, of neurons in an animal just by shining light on the animal. And in this way, establish causal relationships between the activity in a particular neuron and behavior. So my lab has recently generated uh, one type of a brain-wide neuron behavior map for Drosophila lava. And here you can see that for uh, different neurons, um, there we are reporting the probability with which they activate each of the 29 different behaviors that we were monitoring. Now, there is one problem with what I've told you so far, namely each of the example maps that I've used are in a different species. What we really need to be able to do is to combine all of these maps in a single species, ideally in a single individual. So over the last years, my lab has been working to develop a model system in which we can really combine all of these levels of analysis in a single species. So uh, we have been using the Drosophila larva, which, as you can see, has a transparent cuticle. And here is the brain and the nervous system and the peripheral uh, neurons uh, that cover the body wall. And the nervous system of the animal is relatively small and very compact. It has about 15,000 neurons. So it is possible to image the entire nervous system with modern day electron microscopes relatively quickly and to do so in many individuals and then to reconstruct circuits from such electron microscopy volumes. Recently, uh, so here's an example of uh, such an electron microscopy data set, a portion of it, uh, and uh, using software developed by Albert Cardona's lab, we can navigate uh, like in a Google map through this nervous system and follow individual neurons. That's what these little yellow triangles are and annotate the connections they're making with other neurons. So in this way, using this technology, my lab together with Albert Cardona's lab and many other collaborators have recently completed the connectivity map of the entire Drosophila larval brain. Uh, this gives us a catalog of all neurons in the brain. So here's an example of left and right pairs, uh, different neurons, you say they have cell bodies and then different kinds of projections. And uh, here are all the neurons, some of them have uh, projections into the nerve cord so they can control, they can trigger actions. And for each neuron, we, we have this connectivity matrix. So from, for each neuron, we can tell which other neurons it is making connections with in the left and the right brain hemispheres. And this type of a connectivity map is an incredibly useful resource, and it provides many clues and hypotheses about the way in which the brain might perform particular computations. In addition to that, as I mentioned, the larva is transparent, so we can also generate neuron activity maps. Here's an example of imaging the activity in the entire nervous system of the animal with single resolution using light sheet microscopy. So here are some uh, neurons that are being activated in the brain as the nerve cord is performing forward crawling activity. 
Finally, it is of course Drosophila, so we have very good genetic tools. It is possible to generate uh, tools for targeting selectively individual neurons. And over the uh, last years, my lab has, uh, together with Jim Truman, has developed a genetic library of uh, Drosophila larval lines with which we can selectively target protein expression to individual pairs of neurons in the brain. So here is an example of uh, nervous system in which we are targeting green fluorescent protein to individual pairs of neurons. So here's one neuron pair, different neuron pair, etc. And in this way, we can target expression to a, a very large fraction of neurons in the larval brain. And we can not only target green fluorescent protein to them, but those rhodopsin channels with which we can remote control the activity of individual neurons in freely behaving animals and establish causal relationships between their activity and behavior. Last but not least, Drosophila larva has a rich behavioral repertoire. They can generate many different actions and sequences of actions. And my lab has developed methods for automatically monitoring and quantifying different actions of these animals. And importantly, we can do all of these levels of analysis in the single species and in the single individual. Larvae are also capable of uh, different types of learning, including associative learning. So they can learn to approach odors that are repeatedly paired with rewards, for example, fruit. They can avoid odors that are repeatedly paired with punishments, for example, predator attack. And they often have to make complex decisions, for example, whether to, make, to approach or avoid a combination of odors that have been paired both with reward and punishment. They express their memories by controlling two mutually exclusive motor patterns. So they approach good things by repressing turning and promoting forward crawling, and they avoid bad things by doing the opposite, repressing forward crawling and promoting turning. Like all insects, the larva has a high order learning and memory center specialized for forming large numbers of associative memories, associations between odors and good or bad value. And here I'm showing you our electron microscopy reconstruction of this learning and memory center with different neuron types in different colors. So these are the major types that comprise this learning center. There's a large number of so-called Kenyan cells. And these neurons in small combinations, small unique combinations, represent individual odors. Then there are dopamine neurons that carry information about rewards and punishments in the environment that are present to the animal. And they are the ones that drive learning. They provide the teaching signals for memory formation. Finally, there are the mushroom body output neurons or M-mons that uh, carry information about new learned values of odors. This is the structural organization of this learning center. So the Kenyan cells have very long axons that are subdivided into different compartments. In each compartment, individual dopamine neuron synapses onto an individual mushroom body output neuron and also onto all of the Kenyan cells. The Kenyan cells run through all the compartments and synapse onto all of the mushroom body output neurons and receive inputs from all of the dopamine neurons. So how does this learning center actually make associations between odors and good or bad value? To look at this in more detail, uh, we looked at the roles of individual dopamine neurons and mushroom body output neurons in the larva. So Claire Eschbach, a really talented postdoc in the lab, activated artificially individual dopamine neurons while also presenting odor to the animal and asked, is that sufficient 
to induce a memory? And if so, what type of a memory? And she found that when activating some dopamine neurons together with an odor, this induced positive memory about that odor so that afterwards the animals would approach the odor. So the dopamine neurons could drive memory formation in the complete absence of a natural reward. Other dopamine neurons had an opposite effect on learning, so they could induce negative memories so that afterwards the animal would avoid that odor. What about the mushroom body output neurons? Well, by activating individual output neurons, Claire found that some of them repressed turning. So here I'm showing you a turning angle as a function of time in this blue are in animals that have a particular output neuron activated and in black are control animals. And you can see that activating this neuron uh, represses turning relative to controls. And in fact, therefore, this neuron promotes approach and signals positive value. There was a different type of output neurons that did exactly the opposite. When activated, these output neurons promote turning and avoidance and therefore represent negative value. Putting all this together, this is the functional logic of the larval mushroom body. So dopamine neurons that are activated by punishments and that induce negative memories synapse onto output neurons that encode positive value. And dopamine neurons that are activated by rewards and that induce positive memories synapse onto output neurons that encode negative value. So how is then a new a learned value associated with an odor. Well, in naive animals, the connections between all canyon cells and all output neurons are equally strong. So in fact, an odor will equally activate positive value and negative value output neurons, and the overall net value would be zero. However, Pairing an odor with a punishment will result in the activation of a group of canyon cells that represent that odor with the dopamine neuron that is activated by punishment. And pairing the activation of canyon cells and the dopamine neuron will selectively weaken the strength of connections between those canyon cells and the output neurons in that compartment. So learning, uh, it, it, learning involves altering the strength of connections between neurons, and in this case it involves reducing the strength of connections between those canyon cells that represent a particular odor and the output neuron that is paired with the dopamine neuron that was co-activated with the odor. And so this means that learning that an odor is bad involves weakening connections to positive value output neurons so that the overall net effect are stronger connection, relatively stronger connections onto negative value output neurons. And exactly the opposite happens when the animals are learning that the odor is good. And the same functional logic has been demonstrated in Drosophila adult. So while we now have a pretty good understanding of the way in which learned values are associated with particular odors, we don't understand very well how that learned information is used to compute the overall predicted values of an odor or a set of stimuli and how these predictions are used to drive actions. Because in a normal situation, it is very rare that, the end, that a particular odor is always associated just with a reward or just with a punishment. In real life, probably, the odor is sometimes associated with reward, sometimes with punishments, and also it is very rare that an animal is presented just with a single stimulus. Often it will be presented with a combination of stimuli, some of which have been associated more with rewards, others more with punishments. So the brain must have some way to compare the overall amount of good and bad that has been 
associated throughout the life of the animal uh, with a particular odor or a particular combination of odors or other stimuli. And then based on this comparison, compute the overall predicted value of approaching or avoiding the stimulus. So there must be some kind of a scale in the brain that is comparing the overall amount of good and bad at any situation. So can we find out what these scales might look like? What are the circuit motifs that could potentially perform these computations? So to start to understand that, we looked at the connectivity map for clues. And downstream of mushroom body output neurons, we found a really interesting type of neuron. So these neurons receive input both from positive value and negative value output neurons. In fact, they are excited, they receive excitatory connections from positive value output neurons and inhibitory connections from negative value output neurons. And this makes them ideally suited to perform a comparison between the amount of positive value and negative value. So if an odor has been mostly associated with positive value, then the connections between the canyon cells that represent that odor and positive value output neurons will be relatively stronger than the connections onto negative value output neurons. So the neuron downstream will receive more excitatory input than inhibitory input. Exactly the opposite will happen if the odor has been associated more with negative value. And therefore, this neuron will then be inhibited by odors of negative value. So this connectivity pattern suggests that this neuron might encode overall predicted value bidirectionally. When it goes up in its activity, it encodes positive value. And when it goes down in its activity, it encodes negative value. So this is what the connectivity map suggests, but can we test these predictions functionally? So to do that, Claire Eschbach places individual animals into a microfluidic device and then presents them with odors. So she starts by presenting an odor that has a positive value and induces approach. And this odor is expected to activate more strongly the positive value output neurons. And therefore, we see that this neuron is then, the, the, the downstream neuron is activated by a positive value uh, odor. However, then she repeatedly pairs the odor with punishment. This should induce the formation of a negative memory of that odor, and the odor should lose its positive value and even acquire a negative value, and this should alter the balance of excitation and inhibition onto the predicted value neuron towards inhibition. And this is indeed what happened. Now, this same neuron responds differently in the same animal to the same odor after aversive learning, and is now either not activated or even inhibited by a negative value odor. So these so-called, we will now call them predicted value neurons, they appear to be bidirectionally encoding the value based on a comparison of good and bad things that have been associated with an odor. Now, if this is true, we would also expect that these neurons might be able to promote actions consistent with the, predict with the predictions they encode. So to test that, we now wanted to artificially activate or inactivate these neurons and see what effect that has on the behavior. So uh, Claire activated this neuron. Remember, this neuron is activated by positive value and indeed found that activating this neuron represses turning relative to controls and promotes, therefore, approach as expected. In contrast, lowering artificially the activity of this neuron relative to the baseline promotes the opposite action. So inhibiting this neuron promotes turning and avoidance. 
So in summary, we have identified neurons downstream of the learning center that appear to be comparing the overall amount of good and bad that has been associated with an odor, much like little scales in the brain, and computing the overall predicted value of an odor, and then promoting actions consistent with these predictions. These neurons also appear to then control future learning itself. So these predicted value neurons not only promote actions, but they also connect back onto the dopamine neurons. So this dopamine neuron activity is therefore not controlled only by feed forward pathways from sensory systems that represent rewards and punishments, but also from feedback pathways that carry information about predicted value. And this further implies that what an animal learns depends what an animal already knows, and that no two individuals will actually learn in the same way. This type of an architecture is entirely consistent with contemporary reinforcement learning theories that are often applied to vertebrate learning, which uh, show, which would state that dopamine neurons in fact represent prediction errors, errors between predicted and actual outcomes, so that what drives learning are not simple correlations between stimuli and rewards, but the error between predicted and actual outcomes. And the type of architecture we find in the insect brain is ideally suited for computing these predictions and prediction errors. Now, this type of an architecture is uh, computationally a lot more powerful. So we have, uh, in collaboration with uh, Ashok Litwin Kumar at Columbia University modeled, developed a model of this entire circuit constrained with the connectome and asked what happens to the performance of the model if we take out the observed uh, feedback pathways that carry information about previously formed memories. And we have tested performance on different types of more complex learning tasks, such as extinguishing a memory, second order learning. That is when an animal first learns that one odor is good, and then instead of pairing a different odor with a reward, it pairs a second order with a first order. And that still is sufficient to induce a positive memory about the second order or context dependent learning. And in all cases, having these feedback neurons that provide information about previously formed memories greatly enhances performance on complex learning tasks uh, relative to models which lack the feedback neurons. So the errors are much lower in the controls than in models without the feedback neurons. So in summary, we are beginning to understand the circuit mechanisms by which predicted values are computed in the brain through comparing good and bad that has been associated with stimuli and the way in which then actions are promoted based on these predictions and the way in which these predictions are then used to drive future learning. However, many open questions remain. For example, it is very intriguing why there are so many of these predicted value neurons. In fact, there isn't just one type of neuron that compares all good and all bad things. But instead, there are many different predicted value neurons, each one appearing to compare slightly different combinations of good and bad. Similarly, there isn't just one type of dopamine neuron that could compare predicted and actual outcomes. In fact, each individual dopamine neuron receives a completely unique pattern of input and appears to compare slightly different predictions with slightly different outcomes. Now, interestingly, this is quite similar to the ideas that have come out of recent reinforcement learning literature. So recently it has been shown that, different, that a new type of reinforcement learning algorithms called distributional reinforcement learning can hugely outperform traditional reinforcement learning algorithms. 
uh, in artificial intelligence. So traditional reinforcement learning algorithms simply used one mean predicted value and one mean prediction error. In contrast, distributional reinforcement learning algorithms use a whole distribution of predicted uh, values and a whole distribution of prediction errors. And recent findings in the mouse dopaminergic system suggest that in fact, the brain might also compute a a uh, whole distribution of different predictions in parallel. And that this type of uh, representation greatly enhances performance. Now, how many different predictions are computed is still a mystery, but the architecture we observe seems to be ideally suited for computing in a structured way, many different predictions and errors. So going forward, what we now need to be able to need to do is combine a comprehensive neuron activity map with our neuron connectivity map to determine not just for one or two example neurons, as I've shown you here, but for all of the neurons in this circuit, exactly which features they encode, which types of predictions, which types of errors, and potentially which other features. And then we can constrain our models, both with the connectivity and the activity map, and then generate testable predictions about the essential circuit motifs that render these types of networks computationally very powerful. Finally, our ultimate goal is to also combine yet a fourth type of map with all this information, namely a neuron gene expression map. We have recently generated a transcript home of all of, for all of the neurons in the larval nervous system using RNA sequencing and a single cell RNA sequencing. So here I'm showing you clusters of neurons depending on the patterns of genes that are expressed in them. For each cluster, we can read out the genes that are expressed. So by putting together all of this information, neuron we, can, we can determine not only which neurons are important for behavior and how, but which genes are important for the functions of these neurons. And we can bridge the gap from genes to neurons, to circuits and behavior. And with that, I would really like to thank once again all of the members of my lab who have contributed to this work, Albert Cardona's lab, many other collaborators. And I'm also really grateful to the institutions that have provided incredible support for this work and to our funders for uh, very generous funding. And at the end, I would also like to thank my parents, Nena and Velko, for their uh, incredible support, and also my children, David and Dunya, for being a continuous source of energy and inspiration. And with that, I would be delighted to take some questions. Marta, thank you for an absolutely outstanding talk, really inspirational to see the integration of all those beautiful kinds of measures and manipulations of the nervous system all coming together to address one question, really inspiring science. So we've got the questions coming in on Slido and I'll start on them. So the first is from Nikita Komarov and it's how much of the processing is bilateral or unilateral when looking at the role of the Kenyan cells in behavioral output? Is there crosstalk between the hemispheres when making the decision? That's a wonderful question. Um, we are just trying to figure that out. So there is a lot of crosstalk, a lot of bi bilateral uh, neurons. So um, a lot of communication between the two hemispheres, but we don't yet know what the role of that communication is. Um, we do know that in principle, you could teach the larval half of the brain one thing and half of the brain another thing because at the early stages of sensory processing the information is kept separate all the way until the Kenyan cells but then it does get merged and and we we would love to uh, look into what the role of this uh, communication is in the future 
So the next one's from uh, Matthew Cobb, who says, what a fabulous talk. Mm -hmm. There are many suggestions that adult holometabolous insects might be able to recall things that they learned as larvae. What does your detailed understanding of the structure of the mushroom body suggest might be the answer to that conundrum? Great. Thank you. Also a wonderful question uh, to which we don't know the answer, but a lot of the mushroom body remodels from uh, during metamorphosis. So some of the neurons retract their, some of the dopaminergic neurons and mushroom body output neurons and canyon cells, they retract their uh, processes and reform them. And so those are not the ones that could retain the memory at the level of connections, maybe in some other way. But there are a few compartments in which this retraction does not, remodeling does not occur. So there are a few, especially compartments in the peduncle where the connections between the Kenyan cells and M mushroom body output neurons might persist. And, and there, therefore, there is a possibility of actually retaining the changes uh, in connections from larva to adult. But we, we don't yet know, we haven't looked ourselves at this uh, retention of memory yet, but we'd love to do so. And then there's one from Atale Atta. Does the example in the olfactory system equate to lateral inhibition in the visual system con concept wise? Um, yeah, well, there is certainly in terms of the uh, selection of actions, we do observe inhibition between the neurons that promote opposite actions. So th there is this uh, uh, lateral inhibition circuit motif that um, we see over and over in all of the different areas in the brain, uh, be it between sensory neurons that sense uh, different uh, stimuli or between action neurons that promote different actions. So it's a very common and repeated circuit motifs, motif. And this is the sort of, we would love to identify exactly these sort of canonical and repeated circuit motifs that might play important roles in many different systems across the brain. Yeah. And there's a question from Vladimir Lobaskin. When you say memory is formed, what does it mean physically? Can you detect it by static imaging or do you need to measure the responses? Well, that's a great question, <laughs> to which we also still don't fully know the answer. Our expectation, so we certainly see a memory as a reduction in the co connection strength between Kenyan cells and mushroom body output neurons. Whether this reduction in the functional strength of connection is accompanied by a reduction in the number of synaptic connections or the size of synaptic connections in this system we don't yet know, we are exactly uh, looking at that question with electron microscopy. So uh, trying to teach half of the brain to learn one one thing and the other half uh, an opposite thing and then comparing the structure of the brain, the structure of these connections, yeah. Okay, um, Renak Chilkoti, what led you to pursue a neuroscience career? Um, well, because I'm, I was really interested to, to see how the brain works or to find out more about how the brain generates Initially, I wanted to understand how the brain generates language, but now I would just like to understand how it generates many of the simpler behaviors as well. Yeah, well, that's what you've, has enabled you to pin everything down, I think, with this wonderful larval system is going for a very clear cut case. Lovely question from Julian Huppert. A wonderful talk, of course. You talked about work in different model organisms from C. elegans to Drosophila. How much of what you find is likely to be true in other more complex organisms, such as H. sapiens? Mm -hmm. um, well, we think that a lot of the um, circuit motifs are going to be conserved. I mean, the, the genes that control the development of the nervous systems are conserved across the animal kingdom. We also think that the circuit motifs that perform the fundamental computations are also going to be conserved. 
And in fact, many of them are, we already know that. So I think a lot of the fundamental principles will be the same when we are studying similar computations. And then one from James M. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. I wondered if you might speculate a bit on the evolutionary impetus for the different neuronal structures seen in your research. So how, how they have, I mean, that's another really fascinating question that we hope with um, the new era of high throughput connectomics, it might be possible to address. So it'd be fascinating to start comparing connectomes across the animal kingdom and, and uh, Albert, is, Albert Cardona is starting to look at that and, and then really see uh, how exactly the stack, you know, to understand, first of all, we need to know what the architectures in different species, both closely related and not so closely related. And then we can start pinpoint, uh, pinning down the differences in behavior, hopefully to the differences in architecture. And, and another fascinating question is what drives the evolution of this architecture, yeah. And one from Louis Patino, again, very interesting talk. Could you say more, what defines context in the setup of your experiments and how influential was context in behavioral production and prediction, particularly in relation to stimuli and memory? So yes, I mean, we are certain that context is very important. So if keeping context the same, for, for now we've been keeping the context the same, but if one adds another stimulus, for example, um, that changes how the animal responds, respond both to uh, innate stimuli as well as to learned stimuli. So the use con Context is really, really important for action selection for these animals, and they change it a lot. And also for learning, they learn about context. So um, it's, it's a matter of systematically studying the pathways that carry information about the context. Um, and then one from Varun. Do specific glomeruli make connections to specific prediction neurons and then downstream from these neurons to motor neurons? Additionally, are there instances of these neurons bypassing the general connection pathways when a particular odor is consistently aversive? Well, yes, of course. So, so in the interest of time, I've mostly talked about the learned, the, the pathway for learning in the fly brain. And there is, of course, the parallel pathway for innate information. And these, what I haven't told you is that these prediction neurons, many of them, uh, receive convergent input from both of these pathways, from the learned pathway, the mushroom body that I talked about, and from this innate pathway. So the, the current working hypothesis in the field is that in a naive animal, when the value, the overall net output of the learned pathway is zero, what drives these neurons is this parallel innate pathway, which has a a value that has been ascribed by evolution. So the connections, the strengths are determined through evolution, through development. But then the learning pathways pathway modulates the strength of input of mushroom body output neurons onto these prediction neurons and changes uh, the response, the innate response in that way. So uh, are there any, the second part of your question is, are there any odors that don't get any input from the mushroom body uh, pathway and just have the innate uh, response and cannot be modulated by learning? We haven't yet found that, no, we, we don't think so. Um, but we haven't maybe analyzed completely uh, all of the circuitry to be able to answer, but we haven't found such an example yet. So I think that means that you've already answered the next question, which is from Samir Seki. Marvellous talk, thank you. And what he asked was, can you modify equally inherited rather than learned behaviour? For example, can you change sexual behaviour in Drosophila? So this is now the, the for in, in the larva, they, they, they are children, they don't have sexual behaviour. <laughs> so that, that, that I, in the adult, I don't know if 
people have tried to really modify preferences through learning. I, I'm not sure. In the larva, we haven't found this. So um, there are innately aversive odors that we can change into learned appetitive odors. There are equally innately appetitive odors that we can switch through learning into innately aversive odors. So one can completely switch an innate attraction to innate aversion. Um, there are obviously some stimuli that act as punishments that of course we cannot make into rewards, but they're not olfactory. So a, a pain stimulus, we, we, we can't make the animal uh, uh, find, you know, be attracted to that. But <laughs> Okay, the next one is from Mitsuko Nakajima. Are these learning as effective when they're older in adults, are there any experiments on impact of aging or disease? So again, different life history stage. Um, yeah, great uh, question. And um, we have, so we, I, I can't compare larva and adult in terms of learning. We haven't done those comparisons under the same controlled conditions. So I don't know uh, who learns uh, more efficiently, um, but uh, we have compared uh, very early first insta larva and third insta larva. We haven't found a difference, but they're all very young. So I think that's a great question to ask in Drosophila adult, uh, whether old uh, flies and, and very young flies uh, learn equally efficiently. <laughs> And the next one's from Vish Chandra Sekharan. The identities of the 302 neurons in C. elegans are preserved between individuals. The 60 billion or so in humans likely aren't. So how will your studies of specific neurons in flies extrapolate to primates? Well, I mean, I actually think that the identities of cell types in humans are also preserved at the cell type level. At the individual level, this may be less important. I mean, even in a fly, for example, there are single neurons whose I, many neurons are just uniquely identifiable, but sometimes you have a little type, i.e., for example, Kenyan cells. They're all the same to each other. And, and so within us, they can be considered a cell type. It doesn't really matter that they're individually preserved from animal to animal. The, what matters is that the cell type exists from animal to animal. So sometimes a cell type consists of a single neuron. Sometimes it consists of a hundred neurons, sometimes of a thousand neurons. What's, it's the type that performs the particular computation. And that is, I'm sure, preserved um, in, in humans too. So I think we're going to have to make this the last one. It's from in the interests of, of time. Uh, there's a lot of interest here, <laughs> many questions. Uh, but this one's from Trevor Robbins. Nice talk. How does a dopamine neuron know whether it's a reward or punishment neuron? In other words, what determines this? And can, uh, and can turning sometimes be part of an appetitive orientation to a reward? Again, great question. So what determines whether it's a reward neuron or a punishment neuron is the pattern of connections from sensory neurons that sense rewards or punishments. So reward dopamine neurons are in a different location of the mushroom body than the punishment one. They synapse onto different areas and they receive input. So reward ones receive excitatory input from reward sensory neurons and the punishment ones receive excitatory input from punishment sensory ones. In addition to that, the punishment ones receive inhibitory inputs from reward sensory neurons. So that's really connectivity, that's development, what determines whether it's a reward or a punishment neuron. Um, what was the second part of the question? Uh, let me go back to Slido. And it was, oh, I don't have the question anymore. Um, Oh, I know. It was about orientation. Um, turning ah, back yes. here. Could it be turning towards a reward rather than away from an aversive stimulus? Yes. In fact, the turning behavior to reward and punishment are simply opposites to each other. They absolutely, that's exactly 
the, the way it works. So it can turn towards a reward or it can turn towards a punishment. And they also do relief learning from, so, so they can learn to turn um, away uh, towards a, disappear, a punishment that's a, this is, that is disappearing, <laughs> if that makes sense, yeah. Okay, there are a lot more questions, but uh, we allowed 15 minutes. And Marta, I'd like to thank you again. You've, you've given, I think, great stimulating talk, huge amount of interest, many questions, and good luck with your research. It, thank it, you so much. And thank you for the lovely introduction and the lovely questions uh, to everybody. <laughs>